we'll begin reading in verse 24 of Luke chapter 11. The Bible says, When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through the places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept and clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. Not a very encouraging portion of scripture, I admit. But the illustration that Jesus is using in the passage is comparing a man to a house and explaining how that there are residents within that house and how that those residents can change. Sometimes the residents who come into the house are welcomed guests and other times they aren't welcomed guests and you can't wait until they leave. Sometimes you can't get them to leave. And that's what I'm here to help do. I can help you get rid of the guests which are abiding in your house that you don't want to have there. But it doesn't, the responsibility doesn't stop there. Because the guests go out and they roam about and, and, and they can come back into the house if you're not careful. So this is something that I think Jesus is drawing a real heavy comparison to, and it's a lesson for us. Amen. Let's pray before we continue. Father, we need wisdom and, and understanding as we look at the passage before us today. Help us to get what's being taught here and to understand the illustration that Jesus is using in Jesus' name. Well, I think the lesson, uh, we could go many different ways with it, but I believe the lesson which is being taught here most is about first unclean spirits which dwell within us as lost people, those who do not know Christ as their Savior. And then there is a sense of what we'll call false repentance. In other words, temporarily, when the, the residents inside of the house of our life leave, but that isn't really truly led by the Lord. It's simply uh, these unclean spirits uh, departing from your house, but dangerously they can come back. I want to read what one uh, or actually two old commentators said about this. They were actually brothers. It was interesting. There was uh, John, Jacob Abbott and John S.C. Abbott. And these two brothers got together. They became Christians and they were both authors. And they uh, wrote a commentary of the scripture collectively together. And I find that interesting because usually you have one person with their opinion. But here are two brothers giving both of their insight into the scripture. And here's what they said about this passage. The class of sufferers here alluded to were sometimes, it would seem, apparently relieved by the arts of exorcists. In other words, those who had cast out all of those unwanted spirits within them. Perhaps by medical treatment. But then it often occurred in such cases that after a short interval of rest and composure, the demonical frenzy would return with new and more terrible violence than before. So Jesus predicted that the nation, the Jewish nation, upon which his ministry produced a temporary good effect, would soon abandon to obduracy and wickedness. Again, obduracy is a word we don't use much anymore, if ever which means uh, unmoved by persuasion or pity or tender feelings, stubbornness or unyielding, persistently in, uh, impentant or uh, in, uh, unrepentant kind of thing. 
And so he's basically saying these unclean spirits which are cast out, or if they were uh, physically affecting the person, perhaps that a person experienced a healing, and then they felt much better after having been healed. And they, they have a temporary release from what was happened, what had happened there. But then Jesus goes on to say, but you got to be careful with this because the demons can come back. In fact, they can come back stronger and worse than they were before. Well, while they were gone, you might have cleaned all kinds of things up. The house, your life, might look a lot better than it did before because these demonic spirits, uh, uh, spirits have departed from you and you've taken and taken the opportunity with them departed to really clean up your life. You might actually look pretty good on the outside now. None of the old scrapes and scars and bruises and other things and Maybe you've stopped uh, with uh, your uh, addictions that you had before, and you're feeling quite healthy now, feeling quite good. But then Jesus says, but if it was all done under the wrong pretenses, and if it wasn't done with my motivation, then they could come back and take up a boat and, quite be, and be quite happy with the new house that they are entering into, that it's all nice and clean now giving them all that much more to destroy. All the walls that were full of graffiti have now been painted over, giving them a fresh slate to start all over again. You begin to see the picture of how Jesus can use this illustration of a little house to be us. So there's some things that we need to learn about this, and I think this will be helpful to, uh, to you and to me as we consider our own lives in relation to this. I've used two words, and these are what I'll refer to regularly through the message. The word reformed and the word renewed. We need two words to contrast, and those are the two I've chosen. Reformed and renewed. One of them is all done by us. We reform our lives. We determine we are going to get better. We are going to accomplish. We're going to read self-help books. We're going to do some workouts. I am capable. I don't do many. But I, you know, I'm going to do some workouts, and I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to start eating right. I'm going to start really getting things into shape. And, hey, I'm feeling pretty good because of the steps that I've taken. This is reformation. This is me being reformed. Then there's, on the other hand, renewed. Actually, often, this, is, this comes about when a person gets to the gym. I'm giving you the illustration as well. And they get on the treadmill and they say, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. Actually, I don't know if I'm capable of beating my life in shape. I'm, I'm so out of shape. In fact, I look at the people around me who are doing all of this and I say, I can never look like that. I can never live up to this, this reformation model. I'm incapable. I've got too high uh, a mountain to climb. I've got too far of a road to walk. i just got too much. I'm, I'm just not capable of that. And then Jesus comes along and says, so if I were to just say to you, how would you like a new body? Mm, well, <laughs> hey. Talk to me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> talk to me. I'd like to hear more about, well, what, this body you've got, you say it's not capable of doing all those things. No. Well, what if I replace it? What if I give you a new body? And, and would you be able to do something with that one? Oh, I might, might just be able to, yeah, you know, all those aches and pains gone. I wouldn't even have to begin listing them. I wouldn't have to begin listing all the places that need repair. I'd actually be able to say, bin all of that, this new car has got loads of things right with it and start over. And do you remember the messages I've talked in this series already just about how that Jesus deals in replacement. Jesus deals in giving you a new life, a new man. Old things, as our opening uh, call to worship said, all things become new. Jesus looks at giving us a complete replacement of everything which had gone wrong. I'm always concerned when I hear people who are looking for physical healing. They say, I really need the Lord to heal me. They 
come in through the door of a church and they enter in and say, I really need prayer, Pastor, because I need healing. Very seldom do we approach them with the question, why? That's not a common one. I mean, we're just supposed to just come in and just get fixed. What do you mean, why? Because I'm broken, I need to be fixed. Yeah, but why do you need to be fixed? Or let me put it this way. What are you going to do once you're fixed? Well, what are you going to do with your life once you get healed? Are you going to head back out and never come back in again? Yeah. Are you going to go back to the lifestyle that abused you and broke you in the first place so you can just get abused and broken again? Yeah. Is that why you want to get healing? In that case, I'm really not interested in healing you because it's not going to do you any good. It'll just make you healthier to get messed up worse. And this is what Jesus was using in the illustration. You can come in and you can get this stuff fixed, but why? What are you going to do with it once it's fixed? This is one of the things that always bothered me about the gift of tongues. We read about this over in Acts chapter 2. We read about how that the room was filled and those who were in it were uh, able to speak with tongues, different languages that the Lord gave them utterance to. And we get times in churches today where people are filled with the Spirit, they say, and I'm not, I'm just qualifying this for the sake of my illustration. They get filled with the Spirit of God and they really they speak with tongues and they prophesy and they, do, they uh, exemplify all of these gifts of the Spirit and then they leave and go back out and have a pizza and, uh, you know, a little uh, coffee with some friends, party, talk until night go to bed, and nothing is different about them. Well, if you got filled with the Holy Spirit, really filled with the Holy Spirit, and God did some incredible things to you, there is a certain spiritual energy which would enter you, which you couldn't just switch off and go have a pizza and calm down as soon as the service is over. You couldn't do that. You'd say, how do you know? Because they did in Acts, if you look, that was Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Just two chapters later, in Acts chapter 4, the Bible gives us a little bit more information about what happened. And the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mention tongues then in verse 31. It says, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They went and did things that they were otherwise incapable of doing. The illustration in chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9 is about Peter. Who was Peter? Let's just remember for a minute. The apostle Peter, who was he? Was he a highly educated, intelligent, intellectual man that Jesus... The guy is a fisherman, okay? He was, he was as rough as they come. That's what he had done all of his life. You can just close your eyes and imagine what he might have looked like because he spent most of his life out on a boat in the water underneath the elements. You can figure that his skin probably looked a bit rough and his complexion was a bit shriveled. And he, you know, he was, he was a man's kind of man. Peter the fisherman. Well, the Bible says in Acts 4 and verse 8 and 9 that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And you know what he did? He walked up to religious leaders and he began speaking boldly to them about the things of God. I don't know about you, but I, could, I would be quite taken back by, you know, I'd be looking at my friends going, who's he? Who's he? What's this? You know, this guy doesn't look like he's educated. Who is he to tell me all of these things? And yet what he was speaking was truth because he'd been so full of the Holy Spirit. That he spoke the word of God with boldness. Then nothing in there about being filled with the Holy Spirit and then going back to fish the rest of the day. He was so changed, he couldn't switch off. He couldn't just turn the switch off and go back to living his life normally. It concerns me. I'm only going to say this and I'm not going to spend any more time on it. But it concerns me greatly when I run into Christians who have said that they have had a powerful experience with the Holy Spirit that was just earth shattering. I want to ask them, and what did you do when it was over? Well, I went home and went to bed, watched television, listened to the archers. 
hands and say, hmm, hmm. When I hear somebody like that, you know what I want to hear, to believe it is really an hour. And I couldn't, I couldn't go home. I went to my friend's house. I went down to the coffee shop. I went down to the street corner. I went into, I, I just had to tell some people. I was so full of the Holy Spirit. I just, I, before I knew it, it was two in the morning and I was still talking about the Lord. Okay, now you're on to something. You see what I mean? Now I'm beginning to see that maybe something happened inside of you that was different and life changing, earth shattering. It was different. Because the Holy Spirit filled me and I did what I could never have done if he hadn't. This is the difference between reformation and renewal. This is the difference between something conjured up in man to say I have had an experience. It was a little one of these. Woo! You know, that's, a, it, that's an illustration. But it's just this feeling. I, I felt somebody prayed for me, and I went, ooh, something just happened. You know, you say, no, this isn't the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I felt I had a little bit of a pain in the joint, and I was prayed for, and ooh, I felt a little better. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm making a point. The point is that things that God does are catastrophic. I'm going to get really, really touchy with this only to prove my point. I'm not, again, I'm not saying these things don't happen. But you say, I saw some man's leg grow after it was prayed for. We took out the ruler and you could see there were centimeters difference from before and after. And I say, when God does it, it doesn't grow centimeters, it grows feet. Suddenly, something that was an impossibility and questionable has happened because God did something that made me not go, whoo, it made me go, whoa, <laughs> you know, I, I, that, whoa, because that's unexplainable, because you can't reason that away. When the Red Sea parted, there was no question that it was a miracle. When Lazarus came walking out of the grave with grave clothes wrapped on him after having been there for three days, dead, surely he stinketh. I love that verse, you know. And he comes walking out. There's no question he was dead and he's alive. And that's the difference between when God does something catastrophic inside of us. I have seen people whom the Holy Spirit has filled. I have seen people that I, without a question or of a doubt of any kind, know something happened to that person. We've had a few in this church. We've had a few people who've received Christ, and from this point to that point, they are not the same person. There is no similarity between them. The person that they were before they received Christ and after are distinctly different people. They're doing things now that they would have been incapable of doing before. <laughs> incapable. Romans chapter 12 talks about it as being mind renewal. When God renews your mind. I love those verses. Look with them. Look at me. Uh, look at them with me. Romans chapter 12. We need to see this together. Romans chapter 12. This is when the Apostle Paul is making it very clear to the Roman church what this is. Romans chapter 12, he says this beginning in verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The King James uses the word, this is your reasonable service. I might paraphrase it to say, this is the least you can do. This is the least you can do. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
renewing of your mind. Look at the words. Think about them. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me, let me just be very, very honest. There are some people in this church, certainly within Christendom, but within this church, who need a transformation and a renewal of your mind. This little area, <laughs> mine you can see quite clearly, but uh, <laughs> there's no hair impeding your view, but um, this little area is a battlefield. And it is a battlefield in the world in which we live today that Satan loves to play on. He is trying so hard to win at the battle of your mind. You see, because he can't get the battle of your soul. That's been already conquered. Jesus has already paid the price. The only battlefield he's got left he can compete in is the battlefield of your mind. If he can just get you to think that you're defeated, then you'll feel defeated, you'll act defeated, even though, hear me, you are not defeated. But he will try to get you to think you are. That's his battlefield, see? And so he can insert and throw in things inside of that battlefield. He can get you to want things you shouldn't want, to desire things that you shouldn't desire. He can play in that battlefield of your mind, and he can have a lot of fun if you'll let him stay there. But Jesus wants to renew and transform your mind. He wants to help your mind align with your spirit and your soul. Paul battled this. He said, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. And he had a constant battle with it. But the Lord wants to give you victory. Outwardly reformed instead of inward transformation is not good enough. Oh, I want to get better. I want to do better. I want to. Do you hear all of those sentences started with the word I? I want to. I want to. I want to. I uh, met a person several years ago. And I was uh, quite taken by how many self-help books they had in their library. Because I could just see that when I walked in their home and they have all these self-help books, it was overwhelming to me. It wasn't one or two about one thing. It was so, and they, they said this to me, I just can't seem to get enough of them. I just keep wanting to pick up and read another one of them. I thought, you're like bailing uh, the water out of your boat with a bucket every time you know I get a new bucket and I just keep trying to bail it out you you need help that goes beyond self truthfully you need Jesus to help you overcome the issues that you face because you can't yeah for a while you can but believe me it's like a it's like somebody going on a diet diets scare me because all, and not for many reasons, but I'll give you one of them. Don't laugh yet. You know. But one of the reasons is because all the people I seem to know who go on diets get bigger once they get finished. Don't they? I'm just being honest. They lose weight and they look fantastic and we compliment them and we put our arms around them and we congratulate them and we come back and see them five years later and we go, oh, you know. <laughs> They're bigger than they were when they started the last diet. Please don't diet anymore, you know, because you just keep getting bigger. This is the problem. It's like emptying out your shed. You know, we have spring cleaning. We empty it all out. We come back the next year, and there's more stuff in it than there was when you cleaned it out, or, you know, before the first time. What happens? Well, it, this is the point. Jesus is saying, if you do all of this stuff on your own, you're not ever going to win it. It just clears it out and makes it worse for the next time. You need Jesus' help, not self-help. That sounds like a little cliche. You should write a little pamphlet on it, you know. But it's, it's about getting God to help us instead of us helping ourselves because we're never going to be able to do it for long. We're never going to do it in a sense of permanency. It's like watercolors. Painting your house in watercolors. Oh, it looks so beautiful. And then the first rain destroys it. 
Well, it was so pretty. I had it looking so good. Yeah, but you didn't have it in any kind of a permanent fashion. This was just temporary. God says, I want to come in. I want to renew you. I want to make you new. Ordinary reformation instead of inward transformation. I worry about phrases we use today. When we use phrases, this is popular in the business place. You'll hear people say, and I'll, I'll use the words carefully here. We, uh, what must, uh, this is what we must do to be seen to do such and such. We need to do this in order to be seen to do this. What they're really saying is we don't really want to do that, but we need people to think that we are. <laughs> we don't really want to to clean it up completely, but we need people to think that we are cleaning it up. We need for them to see that we are so that the outward appearance looks good instead of actually what really is taking place. It always worries me when that phrase is used, to be seen to. That's reformation. We want the outward appearance to look as if we are really good, where in, in reality we are not. Then you get this where you get guys in the younger ages who are trying to appeal to a pretty girl. Uh, and they do things which they think will help them get the girl. This happens all the time. Sometimes parents will say, don't you date that boy if he's not a Christian. And if he doesn't come to church, this isn't good. And the boy says, hmm, become a Christian, go to church, get the girl. Yeah. And so what a, don't, don't give me your testimony. <laughs> but this, this is this is the renew and you get guys, very clever guys. In fact, they don't even have to be very clever guys. Um, who just say, hmm, if that's what I need to do, and, and trust me, listen to me, I know them, and maybe you do too if you've been a Christian any length of time. I know them. And the next thing you know, the girl comes in and says, but mom, dad, he's come to church. He's coming to church now. Can I date him? How long has he been? I don't know, two, three, four weeks, five weeks? Great. Do you know he could last a long time? He could last six months. He could be coming. He could get involved. He could do all kinds of things, but what has, I'm not saying he didn't really truly transform. I'm saying be careful because he may have just reformed to get the girl. And the next thing you know, when he's got the girl, why hasn't he ever come to church anymore? I never see him anymore. I've known adults like this. One comes to mind instantly. Re really nice guy, but he wasn't really committed Christian. But there was a very attractive woman that he wanted to marry, and he started coming to church, got involved in church. Really, really looked good. They got married. He never went back to church again. Got what he wanted. Ticked the boxes. Outwardly reformed. Won the battle. As far as he was concerned, that was the whole reason he was doing it. I don't know how to guard against it. I'm not giving you cautions. I'm just saying this is the difference between reformation and renewal. I've seen some of them reject and say, no, I'm not dating you. You're not a Christian. And for the person to say, okay, I'm going to change. I'm going to come to the Lord. I'm going to be different. Regardless of whether I get the girl or not. Then the girl goes, oh, I like this. The parents begin to say, hmm, I like the way this sounds. Regardless of the girl, I want the Lord. There's true change. Okay, this may be different. After a period of time, we see a change. We start to see it's legitimate and it's real. And we say, okay, this wasn't just to get the girl. This is true renewal that's taking place. What about death row conversions? We hear it all the time. Death row. Maybe if I become a Christian, maybe if I write books, maybe if I give my testimony, maybe if I preach, maybe if I sing, maybe, my, maybe I won't have to die. And I've seen them all the way up to the end. Still, it can last a very, very long time reformed. But if it's not really true renewal, the day's going to come and the Lord's going to look and the Lord's going to say, I'm sorry, I don't even know who you are. Depart from me because it wasn't real. 
Luke 11 gives us this. Listen, as we looked at this passage we saw before, Luke 11 talks about the demons who are going out through dry places. They know they're temporarily being asked to leave. They're not permanently being asked to leave. So they go through dry places. They make no connection. They seek rest. This is the person who's vacated, uh, who, who's cleaned their house and been reformed. And they seek rest, but they don't find any. They come to church. They sit in church and they say the words, it just doesn't do anything for me. They sit in church and they say, I got nothing out of it. It just didn't do anything for me. This is reformation. This isn't transformation. When you say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Not the church to do. It's like a John F. Kennedy speech. Well, ask not what you can do for your church. or for your, your church. Can, you know what I mean. What your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. We don't often think of coming into church in order to be a place of service. We think of it as coming in as being a service station. You wait on me. You know, you give me the snacks, you pump in the petrol, and then I go away happy. Instead of, I come in to serve. I come in in order to be able to be here to say, what more can I do? Tell me, ask me. If I can't do it, I won't, but ask me. I want to be able to serve. I want to come here to serve, not just to get. I always find it a shame, sad, when we'll have someone who comes, visits, and then leaves, and I go see them, and they say, I just didn't get anything from it this morning. Okay. Did you give anything to it? I, we had one lady who came to visit. Some of you may remember. I won't ever name the names. But we had one lady who came in to visit. And she came in, she sat down, and she got on her mobile phone from the time that she got here until the time that she left. And she did this for several weeks. And finally, when I went to her and I said, you know, it was lovely to have you, and I'm sorry you're not coming. She said this, yeah, I just didn't find the people all that friendly. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody ever came up and said hello. We don't want to interrupt you from being on your mobile phone. You know, that was your way of closing yourself in, protecting you, you know. If a man finds friends, he must make himself friendly. You know, who did you talk to when you were there? This is a lot of the difference. And uh, when you put yourself into a box, nobody's going to bother you because some people, that's what they want. They want to come in like that. We've had other people who've come and left because they said, we're too friendly. They wanted to be too, you know. They want to be to themselves. They don't want to be bothered. They'd rather go into the back of a church and, and, and disappear or something. And there are people like that. And sometimes where well, you're too friendly, you're just too, too much, you need a balance. The heart of a disciple in renewal. When Jesus confronted Peter and the disciples and he said to them in John 6, will you also go? And what Peter said is so precious and it comes from the heart of a true disciple. When he said to Jesus, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else am I going to find that? I can't get that anywhere else. You have the words of eternal. Lord, I've come to you. I don't want to go no pl any place else because you're the one who gives me the words of eternal life. For those of us who have experienced that, to know that with Jesus, everything becomes different. I can't go anywhere else. I don't feel comfortable anywhere else. I can't go outside and roam and, and, and do anything because I just want to come back in. I have to say I loved it when my girls through the summer were given permission, of course, to be with mom and to go to visit different churches to get away from the Sunday school and have a break. And when a few of them really missed coming to church, that's really, I'm telling you the truth. They, no, I want to go with daddy this morning. I miss our church. I miss our people. And you know how they are. They'll come and tackle you on Sunday morning. Because you're family to them. This is the love of saying, no, I, I have a connection here. Where else am I going to go that I'm going to feel like that? This is my home. These are my friends, my family, my people. 
I love that. And that's how it should be when there's true renewal rather than just self, outward transformation. In Matthew 2, the Bible says that the shepherds or the wise men, when they went to see Jesus, talking about Christmas already, but when they went to see Jesus and uh, then the Bible says after they had seen them, they departed to go back to their own country another way. I know what that means. It means that the Lord was uh, protecting them from being destroyed by Herod. I know that. But I had a preacher who loved that verse so much because he said, you know what it says to me? When you've been with Jesus, you can never go back the same way. You just can't. Once you've been with him, once you've seen him, once you've spent time with him, you just can't go back the way you were. You've got to go a different way. When you've had an encounter with the Lord, a real encounter, the old just doesn't fit anymore. You become new. Your house becomes truly clean, and the Lord gives you a lock for the door. You know, because the enemy's not coming back in. This house is clean, and you are not welcome here. You remove the welcome mat. This house is protected by the Lord. Let's pray.